All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the 2008 Social Innovation Competition Final Round and Award Ceremony. My name is Peter Frumkin. I'm the director of the RGK Center for Philanthropy and Community Service at the LBJ School here at the University of Texas. I'm glad you can join us today for what I think is going to be uh, an eventful day full of drama, like that of the American Idol competition, but, <laughs> but, 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 with a loftier mission to find someone who has an idea that might change the world. Uh, three teams of student social entrepreneurs representing universities from across the nation are in the room today holding one desire, and that is to be the team that walks away with a check for $50,000. Our competitors are up front here at this table. When the RGK Center uh, launched the Social Innovation Competition two years ago, the, our idea was to spark the imagination of as many students as possible, uh, encouraging people from all different departments, disciplines, to dream big and find solutions to the world's most pressing problems. In our first year, we invited just students from three Texas universities to compete for our grand pies. Team Accessibility demonstrated a unique software application to provide pedestrian level maps for people with disabilities. They came from the University of Texas at Austin. This year, we went way beyond Texas. We expanded the competition to all graduate and undergraduate students nationwide, and the response was overwhelming. 1,100 students from more than 80 different schools responded to our challenge and submitted their dreams for insightful solutions in a number of areas, ranging from education, healthcare, poverty alleviation, homelessness, alternative energy, uh, and others. From the initial pool of 1,100, we selected 48 semifinalists who were asked to expand upon their innovative ideas and develop a comprehensive plan. After many difficult hours, of uh, deliberation by our semifinalist judges circle, three teams were invited here today to compete for the final prize. Today, as you watch uh, these final presentations, we hope you'll experience the excitement and spirit of social innovation where problems are transformed into opportunities and where the power of a good idea can become a reality. Turning student ideas into actionable plans through this competition could not have happened without the financial support of MFI Foundation and the Reva and David Logan Foundation and also Carmen to Will. Tom and Lynn Meredith, along with their son Will, have been an integral part of the design and execution of this competition from the very start. Tom is on our panel and uh, we'll get to the judges in just a moment. Um, our judges represent luminaries from the business. <laughs> I departed from the script there for just a second. You, you know. uh, they represent luminaries from the business, nonprofit, and philanthropic communities, all having a lifetime of skills uh, in a, identifying success, a successful innovation. Tom Meredith is the general partner of Meritage Capital and CEO, CEO of MFI Capital. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at UT's Macomb School and, uh, and really the vision behind this competition. I came to him with a small idea and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and here we are today. Um, Lisa Huddleston is the exec executive director of Dell's Corporate Foundation. Uh, she's a leader in the Austin community, serving on the board, uh, boards of directors of Leadership Austin and the Town Lake Trail Foundation. She brings to this years of experience in philanthropy and grant making. Phil Berber started his own foundation, a Glimmer of Hope Foundation, after selling his business in 2000. Philip operates the foundation with his wife, Donna, and is invested in development projects in Ethiopia, Ethiopia as well as local programs for disadvantaged youth. Carmen Tawil is an engineer by training, and she's currently the managing partner of Corridor Television. Carmen is a prominent and familiar face around Austin, particularly on nonprofit boards. She's been uh, active uh, with the Austin Museum of Art, the People's Community Clinic, and People Fund. Finally, at the end of the table, is Lee Walker. Lee Walker is chairman of, commu uh, of Community Investments and teaches the freshman course entitled Community in Place in the Plan II Honors Program at the University of Texas. Lee served as president of Dell Computer Corporation during its formative years, and he has, he's the past chairman of the Lance Armstrong Foundation. Susie Sosa <laughs> is a new addition uh, to our judges panel. Susie is chief of staff 
at Empower Labs, a venture capital fund headquartered here in Austin that invests in businesses catering to the underserved. So I want to welcome all our judges. Besides the judges sitting at this table, we have a very important second group of judges today. And e these judges are you. Each one of you is going to have a chance to cast a ballot for who you think has the best idea for making a big difference. And we'll provide a $1,000 People's Choice Award to the team that wins the popular ballot. So listen carefully. Mark your ballots uh, and look for the green box at the back of the room uh, for casting your ballot. Now, let's get down to business. Each of our finalist teams will be given 15 minutes to present their innovation, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers from the judges. There will be a short transition between each of the presentations, and we'd really appreciate it if you could remain seated uh, during the presentations so as not to distract our contestants as they go after the big prize. Um, at the end of the third and final presentation, just to give you the lay of the land, there'll be a break, and our judges will retreat to a secret chamber <laughs> where they will select the $50,000 cash prize winner. So, without any further ado, let's begin the competition. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first team, Planting Empowerment. While in the Peace Corps in Panama, our first contestants began formulating their innovation uh, and, and their big idea for addressing environmental degradation and rural poverty. Team Planting Empowerment is made up of students from Johns Hopkins, Ohio University, Thunderbird, Vir and Virginia Tech. Presenting for Planting Empowerment today is Chris Meyer and Damian Croston. Please begin when you are ready. Thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, my name is Damien Croston, and I am the community liaison for planning and empowerment. My partner here is Chris Meyer. He is the director of business development. Planning empowerment was formed by four former Peace Corps volunteers, each with two and a half years of cumulative service working in some of the poorest regions in Panama in rural development. Now, as volunteers, we were witness to pictures like you see here on the left on an everyday basis. Current land development practices and slash and burn agriculture destroy some of the most environmentally sensitive rainforests in Central America. Deforestation is the cause of 20% of the overall carbon emissions in worldwide. Now an example of deforestation can be seen here on the photo on the right. Now this particular area is the area where we have our base of operations in Panama. This region is classified by Conservation International as a biodiversity hotspot. If you were to look at this area, if this picture, 30 years ago, you would have seen a solid block of green. Now all these areas, the brown areas that you see in this picture here on the right, resemble the picture that you see here on the left. Now on the micro level, what's the cause of this deforestation? Well, land, landless farmers come in and they cut down primary forest. They sell the lumber and then they use the land in order to practice slash and burn agriculture. When the land is degraded, the farmers move to another piece of forested land to continue the process. Now, on, as volunteers, we interacted with these farmers on an everyday basis and often shared many a meager meal with them, often consisting of nothing more than a bowl of rice. Knowing that deforestation was the only, re the only means that they had to feed their family, we were faced with the question, is deforest is ask, can we ask a poor man not to deforest when deforestation is the only means in which he has to put food on the table and feed his family? We came up with the planning empowerment model. Through the planning empowerment model, we're able to offer farmers like Chico, who you see pictured here, an alternative to deforestation. We do so by signing long-term lease agreements with the farmers that gives them monthly income from the lease payments. Now, these lease agreements are only are only signed to lease a portion of the, of the farmer's land, thereby leaving them free to continue with their agricultural. In addition to the lease payments that the farmers receive, they also receive labor opportunities to work with planting empowerment as we work to reforest some of their degraded land. They also receive a future, they also receive a portion of the future profits from many operations that occur on their land. Farmers like Chico now have an economic alternative 
to deforestation through conservation. I'll now pass off the presentation to my partner, Chris. Thank you, Damien. So, how, does, how are we going to finance planting and... How are we going to finance planting empowerment's model? Well, we have three investment products which we offer to potential investors. This, again, is more than just a financial return for the, the investment. It's also a conservation experience. First, we have our flagship forest investment. This is a $7,000 minimum. It also comes along with planting of 550 trees. This is sequestered three tons of carbon annually and will protect 1.25 hectares of primary forest directly. Additionally, we have a new product, the Forest Savings Bond. This is a $25, $50, $100 a monthly payment that also includes a lot of the conservation benefits from the forest investment, but at a much smaller scale. So if you were to invest in the Forest Savings Bond, what kind of uh, materials would you receive? Well, first, every time there would be a transaction, you would receive an account statement, which is required by regulatory officials. Also, you would receive a certificate of tree ownership, noting how many trees you had purchased. And annually, you received an update on how many tree, again, how much carbon your trees have sequestered, how much they've grown, and, and a story updating about one of our land-owning partners. Now, how are we going to go about finding all those conservation-minded investors and consumers? Well, first, we have our website. Our website went live a year and a half ago. And over the last six months, it's been receiving hits at a rate of 20% monthly, increasing, excuse me, increasing 20% monthly. Additionally, this is going to be the platform for this forest savings bond. We also are in conversations with Forest Finance. This is a German firm that sells sustainable forestry investments into the European market. This is a much more mature market than we have here in the United States. They're looking to expand their portfolio of products and approached us about offering our product into the European market. So we'll be selling wholesale to them. This is a great opportunity for us to access that European market. Also, we'll be attending various green festivals throughout the United States. These are where green products are promoted and are attended by, uh, excuse me, conservation-minded consumers. And finally, we have our current investors, people who have already purchased our product. We're going back to them, and, uh, encouraging them to invest again, but also having them recommend us to their friends and family. So what do we have in the pipeline, project-wise? We were actually chosen by McKinsey and the Clinton Foundation to participate in a forestry project. McKinsey has run our numbers, went down and saw our operations in Panama, and will be presenting our project to a group of investors in New York later this month. We also partnered with ProRena, it's a Smithsonian-based nonprofit in Panama. Together we developed the project and delivered it to the World Bank. We expect to hear back from the World Bank if they'll be financing it later in June. Also, we're in conversations with the Inter-American Development Bank regarding a larger project for fiscal year 2009 that would be financed through one of their social venture funds. Lastly, we're in discussions with Conservation International. They have a venture capital arm, Verde Ventures, and they're interested in helping us scale our business through their financing. So why are we, why are we excited about our investment products? Because the total assets for socially responsible investments have been increasing at a substantial greater rate than the overall market. From 2005 to 2007, the investments for social responsible, social responsible investments grew at a rate of over 11% annually versus only 3% in the normal asset market. So we're seeing as a groundswell of interest in the social responsible investments. And we are positioning ourselves to capitalize on that interest. And why a timber investment? Well, that, the Smart Money magazine from 1961 to 2001 found that timber investment returns actually outpaced the S&P 500. Now we believe this is going to continue when you take into consideration the demand for timber from India and China, for example. So who else is offering these type of timber investments? Tropical American Tree Farms is a Costa Rican firm who offers mixed species plantations and also monoculture teak. Most closely aligned to us is Futua Forest Style in Panama. They offer a mixed species plantation with a little bit more conservation type method. Socially, more importantly though, planning empowerment investments, again, we're leasing the land from these local landowners. Our competitors, they're purchasing the land and displacing the, the poor rural landowner. Additionally, planning empowerment is sharing our profits with our community partners and our landowner partners, excuse me. The, our competitors do not do that. So who's making this happen? Again, you have the four founders, all former Peace Corps volunteers, who worked and lived at the grassroots level for two and a half and three years. We brought on a Panamanian forester, Carlos Espinosa. He has 15 plus years of experience in working in forestry and has strong connections with the local conservation community in Panama. 
most importantly, we brought on Liriano Pua. He's a local indigenous youth who's interested in forestry, is now apprenticed to Espinosa, and it's our first steps in our goal of planning empowerment to build the human capacity and capabilities of the local communities there to do this on by themselves in the future. Okay, we have an advisory board. These people are world-class experts from business, conservation, development, and forestry. They've helped us develop this idea, and they'll be continuing to advise us as we move forward. What have we done so far? In January in 2007, we incorporated in Panama, and we planted 11,000 trees last June in Panama. We're going to plant again this next coming June, excuse me, not this month, but next month in Panama again. Numbers-wise, we successfully raised from over 20 investors $60,000 last year for those 11,000, to be able to plant those 11,000 trees. Our goal this year is 140,000. Our major expenses going forward will be marketing and purchasing a software package for customer relationship management. Our goal is 1.4 million by 2010, and those purchases will help us get to there. Right now, we're searching for $100,000 in angel investments. Hopefully, that very big, large, literal and figuratively check from here will be used for that marketing and software expenses. Environmentally, again, for every one hectare of our plantation, this is going to sequester six tons of carbon. Of course, very important in this era of climate change. Additionally, we're very excited about a partnership we formed with our indigenous partners, that for now, every hectare of plantation that we plant, they will be protecting 2.5 hectares of primary forest, a direct link from our product to conservation. Planning empowerment is more than just words talking about how good we're doing. We're going to be measuring the impact. We partnered with the University of Panama Sociology Department to create a baseline study. We're going to be measuring the increases in incomes, how many farmers or landlord partners are actually taking the plantations and doing this themselves in the future, and the institu institutional cap capacity, self-governance ability of our indigenous partners that we're hoping to improve. Okay, here comes the technical tricky part. So. In closing, I'd like to leave you actually with the words of Chico, who I highlighted earlier in this presentation. Chico is Planning Empowerment's first landowner partner we partnered with last year. He's going to speak to you again about how Planning Empowerment has impacted him. Me siento agradecido con el proyecto porque me beneficio y beneficio muchos miembros de la comunidad a la cual pues de otra manera no iba a entrar esa, no iba a tener esa entrada. Creo que sí es muy importante y interesante pues, el proyecto a, a, a nivel de, de provincia, por decirlo así. Bien, y si Planting Empowerment o el, el negocio te ha beneficiado, Sí, mucho, bastante, porque tengo un ingreso mensual que, que anteriormente no lo tenía, pues ya eso me ayuda a mí a facilitar eh, el sustento de la familia, creo que es algo importante. That's all we have. So now uh, we're open to your questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we'll move to pre presentation number two, SWAM. According to UNESCO, only 24% of individuals eligible for college are able to enroll due to financial constraints. Team SWAM from Stanford University is here now to show us a possible solution to this problem. Representing SWAM today is Somik Raha. Take it away, Somik. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Somik Raha, and I'm doing my PhD in Decision and Risk Analysis, Stanford University. And my teammates are Deepthi Ashni and Thomas, who I'll introduce a little later. And our venture's name is called Swayam, which in Sanskrit means self-reliance. Our mission is to remove the financial barrier to education. And a lot of students forego education because they can't access funds. We believe that, should, that is not a sufficient reason to give up on education. So we will help students through future income contracts 
and peer-to-peer -peer investing. So I'll take you through the concept, walk you through our model, show you the market and competitive landscape, the social value chain, discuss the financials, and finally introduce our team. So our own stories are very deeply interconnected with Swayam, and I will just present one of them. Ashni wanted to get into undergraduate education at Stanford, and when she called the admissions office, they told her, well, if you don't ask for financial aid, you have a higher chance of being admitted. So she didn't ask for aid, and her undergraduate debt today is $120,000. And she managed to get this because she had a US co-signer. If you don't have a US co-signer, international students don't get aid, don't get funding at all. And her master's year, she had to work three to four jobs to pay her bills. Now imagine this is a person who came here for education and is running around doing jobs. This is a very common story for most international students who come to the US. Now let's travel a couple of continents apart to India. Bhavna is the daughter of Ashni's cook and she wanted to go to college. But her parents would not spend their limited resources on Bhavna because she was a girl and they would rather you know, spend their resources in you know, managing their daily meals. So she dropped out after the 10th grade, and she was married off at the age of 15. So this is where her system failed her, and she could not get the education she wanted. So education in general across continents, we see these problems, very similar ones. So the pain is that there is a serious lack of funds for people who want to be educated. And a lot of people even fear crippling debt, being stuck with repayments that they can't afford. So our cure is the future income contract, which we call the Swayam Fellowship. So once you're selected as a Swayam Fellow, we will get investment so to pay for the education of these fellows. And in return, when they graduate and they start making money, they give a percentage of their income back. And this is an attractive opportunity for investors because now they're not looking at this as charity anymore. They can actually make money. And which means more money is available for people who want to be educated. And at the same time, compared to traditional loans, students have the peace of mind that, hey, we can have repayments that are commensurate or aligned with our income. So a value proposition really is that many students want an education they can't afford. And interestingly enough, there are many investors who want to create positive social change. And SWAM is really about bringing the two of them together. So the concept is that Swayam Angels, these are our investors, they will invest directly in the education of Swayam Fellows. And the Swayam Fellows will repay a percentage of their income back to the Angels. Now, oops. Swayam will take a small transaction fee from the investors, and they will also take a processing fee, a small percentage of the return from the Fellows in order to remain sustainable. So quick walkthrough. Let's say Anjali comes to Swayam and she needs $10,000 for her last quarter at Stanford. She hears about Stan uh, Swayam through the ethnic, say the Indian mailing list. And she contacts Swayam and she agrees to pledge 5.5% of her income for 60 months after she graduates. <laughs> through our website, you know, people hear about Anjali and say, hey, yeah, this sounds like a bright person and one quarter we'll get the money, cash flows immediately, uh, we'll invest in her. And so Swayam then pledges 4% of Anjali's income to the, to the investors who have invested in her. Now mind you, these investors will have a portfolio of investments, so they're not only getting returns off Anjali, but also of other students. So if I were to just look at the $10,000 investment, then if you compare this to an S&P 500 stock growing at 7%, which is conservative because the annualized rate last year was 6.6%, Swayam's equivalent growth rate turns out to be 7.43%. Oops. What did I do there? Oops. Yeah. And, and if you look at the overall return on investment, Swayam gives you a 17% return versus a regular S&P 500 stock is a 15% return on investment. <coughs> For Anjali, if she took a tra traditional loan, if she was lucky enough to get a traditional loan, which is not true most of the time, she would get something like, say, 6.72% for 13 years. She would end up paying $822 more to Swayam on a term that's eight years shorter. Now, why would she pay more? Well, this is insurance for a rainy day. If she hits a bad patch, 
then she doesn't have to worry about paying amounts that she can't afford because this is a percentage of her income. So in other words, we're really appealing to Anjali's risk aversion. And the nice thing is this is not a theoretical concept. It has been proved, and I'll talk about it in a moment. So our addressable markets, we're going to start at Stanford looking at the international uh, student community. There are at least 400 Indian and Chinese students. And in the Bay Area, international students are around 16,000. In the U.S., 636,000. In now switching off to India, this is the UNESCO statistic. Over 90 million tertiary school age children won't be going to college this year for a variety of reasons, primarily because of lack of funding. So we are looking at both these markets in parallel. Now, how are we going to get the investors? We believe there are some pretty good proxies out there. One of them is Kiva.org, which is making waves in this country right now. They are a microfinance peer-to-peer -peer lending organization, and they have been helping people in developing countries start their own businesses. And Kiva right now has 282,545 lenders who have funded $28 million worth of loans. Mind you, these are interest-free loans, which means if you invest, you don't make any money off the loan. You, just, you might just get the principal back if it works out. And we find so many people who are ready to get involved. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Prosper. Prosper is a company that lends to people in this country, and these are interest loans. And 20,392 lenders have raised $128 million. Our market is all the Kiva investors and the Prosper investors. We're saying you can do good and you can make money at the same time. So we, we'll have a strategy of building a peer-to-peer -peer website, which I have some snapshots which I'll show you in a moment, where in, investors can discover students and students can put up their profiles and say, we need funding. And we'll have field partners. So the field partners, for instance, if you're working in India and China, we're talking to two NGOs. One of them is called uh, Siksha.org in, in India, and the other is Project Hope in China, where they will do the scouting and finding of the students, and we'll use our, our technology to be able to find investors and fund students in these countries. And we, we also have, other, uh, we have the notion of connecting with other NGOs, for instance, Kiva.org, where because they take donations, they take funds for regular businesses, they have, they're getting a lot of queries for education investment. So Kiva can tell their investors that, hey, you could go to Swayam when you want an education investment. So we have planned a lot of tie-ups there. In fact, the founder of Kiva is closely advising us. We'll also have university partners. For instance, at Stanford University or at UT Austin, you know, if, if the administrators find that, hey, we would love to get this student to our campus, but we don't have the funds. Well, that's the place where we'll say, no, don't give up on these students. Give us a chance. We'd like to get them funded. So we'd like to have partners around this country to get such students their education. And of course, we'll have a presence on the ethnic mailing lists. It's, it's, it's amazing how often I see this email, even at Stanford University, where one would think it's a no-brainer to fund such students because they will work in two years' time. But you know, almost none of them have funding. They have to give up, on, you know, they have to use up all their life savings, their, their parents' life savings, to get through their college education. And we also plan to use social networking sites because a lot of the investor community that we're targeting are young people who, you know, people like you and me who might just, you know, donate $100 or invest $50 even. And they would hang out places like Facebook, LinkedIn. We, we'd like to tap these sites to contact them. And of course, university alums, people who have struggled a lot to get to the university know that they want to make it easier for the next generation. So here are some snapshots of what our site will look like. So you could see uh, students who uh, will put up the profiles, and you can see the, how much of the funding is needed. And from the angel's point of view, you'd see what their portfolio looks like, how much they have invested so far in different students, and how much of the money has been repaid so far. And you even have a large mailbox where they can directly connect and advise students. So we have a lounge where students can get mentored once they decide what they want to specialize in. So moving on to our competitive landscape, substitutes are banks and private loan agencies. Uh, these are you know, not, uh, not great substitutes because U.S. banks will not apply or will not help uh, international students. Government funding programs, you have the problem of being stuck for five or six years with them. Family funds, you'll deplete them. 
We do have career concept in Germany which has tried this, but without the peer-to-peer -peer website. So we think we'll actually do even better. And there are nonprofits like the Robertson Education and Empowerment Foundation, uh, which, is, which has limited impact because it relies on donations to get started. So the unique features of our model will develop over time an employment statistics data engine. So we'll know how salaries move so we can design better contracts. We think that the networking between the angels and the fellows would be phenomenal because now investors have, a, have an incentive to make sure that the fellows get a good job when they graduate so they can get money back. So we have a mentorship program. And the most remarkable thing in this, the future income generation model, this is where me and myself and Thomas are doing our PhD on decision and risk analysis. And we'll have a social marketing database where we'll figure out or we'll document strategies of approaching different communities and figure out how they can access our messages in, you know, in a clear manner. So the social value change is that you start with funds, we fund students' education. The result is in a higher standard of living for students and their families. And some of these students might actually become entrepreneurs talking like I am right now, and they might hit it big and give a lot of uh, return to their investors. So that aligns with our goal that we will have effectively removed the financial barrier to education and created a sustainable chain of positive change. So we want to give out contracts initially 30 by the end of the financial year of 2009 and reach 2000 by 2013. Uh, and these numbers are very comparable to what career concept has done in Germany. We think we'll actually be better than this because we have the, uh, the, the additional peer-to-peer -peer website, which they don't. And similarly, we have the returns, uh, the number of repaying fellows. We think we'll, uh, we want to be profitable by 2013. And we'll do this by focusing on fast growth in the number of contracts issued. And we'll focus initially on students who are close to graduation because they're low-hanging fruit. The cash flows will start almost within three months or so. And we'll also charge a $9 fee from investors per transaction. Right now, if you, if you invest in stocks, it's a $10 fee, so it will be $1 less. And the funding that we're asking for is $825,000 for the initial round. Most of this money will go for legal research and another chunk will go into peer-to-peer -peer website development. Our first fellows will be funded by fall of 2008 and they should graduate by the next year, start repaying, and we'll go to the second round. And so this is a breakup. The technical budget is around 415,000, but the legal budget is where most of our energies will go because the incorporation of the future income contract are still okay, but the securities license is what we're really working on. Most, most lawyers here are idea and like, really, will this work? <laughs> we, we don't know because we are, we're operating like an investment uh, firm, so that we need to make sure that we do our securities research on this and we need to pay lawyers a lot of money to do this research. <laughs> So this is our team. Deepthi has a background in microfinance and social ventures. Ashni has done a lot of work in education, holds a master's in education. I have a background in technology, social anthropology, and decision risk analysis. And Thomas has done his PhD in the same area. He's a strategic strategy consultant. And I'd like to end with this quote, which sort of summarizes the, the inspiration that we've come with. John Kluge is the biggest investor in our biggest donor in financial aid in this country. He's given $400 million to Columbia University. And he says, I'd rather by far invest in people and buildings. If I can infuse a mind to improve itself, that will pass on to their children and to their children's children. That is the spirit with which we have come here. This is our website, which has just gotten ready. And if you go to swam.org, you'll actually see some of this up there. <laughs> With that, thank you so much for your time. Okay. We have one more presentation to hear. Presentation number three is Husk Power Systems. Great minds all over the world are currently seeking new resources uh, and new ways of generating alternative energy uh, to bring electricity to those without in the developing world. Uh, today we're going to hear uh, from... Uh, two uh, students from the University of Virginia. Uh, team Husk Power System is made up of Charles Ransler and Manush Sinal. Gentlemen, your turn. And clearly understood the enormous impact electricity will have on uh, rural people. With masters in electrical engineering from uh, U.S. universities, we were confident that we can produce electricity with four things in mind. And those are 
low cost, locally produced, generated, and distributed, being able to run by local people, and self-sustainable. So like we all know, we explored the popular options, which are wind, solar, and fuel cell technologies. All these technologies turned out to be either too expensive or too difficult to operate and maintain. So uh, we targeted or we focused on our target customers, which are villagers. These were mostly farmers growing a lot of rice, and they had houses that, that were clustered. So we hit gold mine, rice husk. 21 million tons of rice husk was produced last year in India as a byproduct of milling rice crops. We figured we can convert rice husk into producer gas. So what do we do with that? We can actually convert that into electricity. So again, Ganesh and I uh, collaborated with a local manufacturer called Prakash Janset, created a proprietary technology that, that converts uh, rice husk-based producer gas to electricity. So we have, being a technologist, we figured out the technology, now what we do. So, <laughs> so again, uh, both of us went to a village called Tumkuha to establish rapport with a council of elderly people called Panchayat to get a community buy-in and their permission to install our first equipment. That was uh, in late May 2007. Uh, so once we got the permission, we installed the equipment. Ganesh Pandey, for the first time, flipped the switch in that village in late August 2007. And that's how we got our first project uh, implemented and village electrified. So we did not stop there. We dig further into our process, and we figured out we can use the waste pro uh, product of generating electricity, which was rice husk ash, to convert that into a pozzolanic material that can replace Portland cement and you can be used in the building material process. So where we stand today, uh, we are Husk Power Systems. We have three villages electrified, of which two are already pro uh, operationally profitable. We are generating cash flow every month. And we have created jobs, already saved 200 tons of CO2. And uh, we already are in the process of filing two technologies that can be patented. So uh, before, or uh, rather after coming to Darden, I met, uh, met Chip Ransler. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. He started two companies uh, in the last two or three years, of which one is non-profit. So I'll now let him walk you through HPS in the future. That, that was in six years, not in two years. That'd be ridiculous. Um, thank you, Manoj. Manoj and Ganesh, we, we, you know, this takes, we have technologies, we have a model that is already working. That's only part of this. We have processes we have to get in place, we have to have people that can actually make this happen. This is very much focused on execution. Manoj and Ganesh are the keys to that right now. Both of these guys are from the areas that we're talking about. Both are extremely well academically pedigreed, also leading, uh, also leading uh, teams of both of these semiconductor companies you're seeing here. Both are going back to India, Manoj after we finish at Darden, to be going uh, to, to, to kind of make their fortunes in India. And Ganesh is already on the ground there as well. We know we can't do this alone. Uh, so just, just to highlight a couple of these, uh, RL Prasad is on the State Electrification Board of Bihar, India, which is the place where we're actually doing our first plants today. Uh, Mac Findlay is the, the biggest buyer and seller, or sorry, producer and seller of biodiesel in the United States, helping us out with biofuels. And uh, Daniel Baer is the head of the Technology Transfer Office at Harvard, helping us out with patentable technologies as well. So these are just a few of the people we've, we've gathered around us. There are more as well. But really, Manoj asked me to help out because we've, they had done this twice, but we want to make this a real, real business. I started looking at this, and there were 125,000 villages that are currently unelectrified in India. This is over 350 million people who spend over $100 billion on uh, diesel and kerosene fuel every year. And we'll be replacing that with our electricity that we're currently providing. We're, currently, we're not trying to do the entire uh, you know, country of India. We're focusing on areas that are very rice rich, which are the rice belt. This, this area in yellow that you can see here is, is low electricity penetration. So they have tons of rice and very little electricity penetration. Also, we're dealing in the carbon offset market as well as the building materials market. So we're, we, we've calculated this. RHA is a, a new technology that we are working with a UC Berkeley uh, graduate student on. We have to, to patent as we speak. That should be about $2 billion a year. And the carbon credit market, as, as we probably know, is, is 
pretty enormous. Hopefully this will work. We did this in Mac. This is PowerPoint, so we'll see if this works out okay. This is our, uh, this is our business model. We get, rice patty, or we, get, we get rice from local villagers. So this is all villages of 2,000 to 4,000 people. Uh, we get the rice from them. They make about 500 acres of rice per year right now. This rice is then milled uh, to separate the grain from the husk. The husk today is pretty much a waste product. So they burn it, they leave it, and let it ferment there. It's, it's actually bad because it off-gasses methane. That rice then we uh, store in a facility that we have, about a 3,000 square foot facility full of 30 or 40 tons of rice right now, a rice husk, excuse me. And then we use that rice to run a plant. And this is our excellent graphic re representation of that plant that I made. I'm not an artist. Um, it combines two technology, a gasification technology, which is old and well understood, with the generator technology that Manoj and Ganesh uh, made with Prakash D, uh, gen sets. So rice goes into the uh, gasifier here at about 50 uh, kilograms per hour. That's gasified, which produces a producer gas. That is then filtered and cooled down and then used to run a generator, which is an internal combustion engine that we've modified again. That creates, oh, so there's, there's this, there's that. Uh, this emits a very little amount of nitrous oxide, CO, CO2. Uh, this is a lot less than any kind of diesel or, gen or kerosene that these people are using today. And then when the electricity actually comes out, we're running this for three different types of people. We have uh, our industrial customers who are on different trunk lines. So we have our industrial customers who are using this for um, rice mills, flour mills, making uh, you know, briquettes for the building industry. Uh, that, that's, that's a large part of our revenue. These people are paying about 25 cents per kilowatt hour right now. Uh, irrig irrigators are also paying about the same amount. We're generating power from our plant at about 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour, which is very good for a biomass plant. Uh, fi finally, we run this out to households as well. It, historically, trying to get power to households has been hard because of the collections problem with these very poor people. We've gotten around that with some clever, uh, clever things, both technologically and implementation-wise. We have uh, circuit breakers, which actually cut people off if they use too much electricity. Well, how much is too much electricity? Every month, we do a census on uh, each household. We, we, one of the people we hire locally goes around and sees how many appliances these people have. So they have like two light bulbs, a fan, and a radio. If they use more than the ampage they're supposed to be using, like 20% more, it cuts them off. These people are prepaying for this power as well. So there's no real collections problem. Thus, we have a 100% collections rate because if you don't pay, you don't get power. And if you, don't, if you use too much, you get cut off. So we're, we're able to actually do this now extremely well. We have been very successful so far. So we don't really stop there. Again, as Manoj said, we use the ash. So the idea is to use every piece of this rice husk that we're able to, to capture. RHA is, again, this, the, what we're helping develop right now with this person from Berkeley, which is a waste product that we're going to be uh, centralizing. And even the emissions from, from actually the, the bad defect, defect gas we're using to uh, boil water for the, the village itself. So all of this, we, we offset methane, we offset, uh, we, sorry, we, we offset CO2 for methane, for uh, the diesel generators, the kerosene, we're, we're increasing the, the ability for car, uh, concrete to be able to cut CO2. So we gather all these CO2 offsets from uh, each one of our villages. But our real, real ability to help make this work effectively is to be able to network villages together. And we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, we, we, we gather all these. The uh, RHA goes to a refinery, which we will have, and then sell to the concrete market. And then the CO2s are going to be sold through CO2 brokers, uh, which, are, which are right now like Eco Securities, Ag Cert, Cargill, uh, which we've already been talking to as well. And then we get revenue from all these things, plus the electricity that we're selling. So we have three different ways we get revenue, and we think that's... Awesome, don't we? Yes. So, for a P&L for each village is uh, this didn't work either. Um, P&L for each village at 75% capacity for the first year. We're running right now at about we've been in at eight months. We're running about 60%, uh, and our cash flow is negative, but we're breaking even in two and a half years, topping out at about 31 and a half. Uh, thousand dollars at the end of uh, year five. Our business development strategy is to create a network of villages as fast as possible. We're already partnering with MFIs to be, at, uh, sorry, microfinance institutions to be able to do this. They need our power. We need their customers. When we get into villages, we're able to keep them because we're getting long-term contracts. And we don't think people love what we're doing. They're not going to be going away. We're talk, we told you about rolling up our CERs, which are certified emission reductions, and RHA. Uh, we're doing that. Uh, as we speak, we're getting certified by TUV uh, Süddeutsch Land, which is a certification uh, 
entity for the clean development mechanism. Finally, we have uh, customer and, and headwaters international for our RHA technology to be able to be used in 2000, at the end of August of this year. And we have to be able to expand our critical business processes as we'll talk about in a second. But we're going to be uh, developing pretty quickly. We've already got three. We're hoping to get 20 by the end of this year and hope to have 5,000 by the end of 2013. We think we can do this. Uh, also using uh, key, key people like, for example, we have already have a, 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 a partnership with the Patna College of Engineering, which we already are training engineers to be able to install and run these plants on a daily basis. By 2011, we should have 1,000 technical operators graduated from this. Uh, but this is already going on as we speak today. So that's what we're, our business does. What's the actual social ROI value chain in terms of what we're actually delivering? We buy husks from farmers, we give them new amounts of cash. We save them 45% on the fuel that they're using today. Instead of diesel, they can use our electricity. Instead of using petroleum-based fertilizer, they can get fertilizer from us really cheaply by using our decomposed uh, ash. Households get, get electricity at 30% off of what they're getting it today. They get better lighting, get better entertainment. They can watch TV, they can listen to the radio. Instead of having kerosene in their homes, they can have electricity, which is better for their health. So they have about 200, uh, MPV of this over a 10 year period, I'm sorry, is about $266,000. Micro enterprises, we, we hire three people in each village. We also uh, are able to let people have an infrastructure for making businesses, which is, has a $116,000 MPV. Finally, the environment is greatly affected because we're off offsetting methane, we're offsetting diesel, we're offsetting, uh, offsetting uh, kerosene. Over a 10 year, or sorry, a five year period, uh, we will have uh, offset about 700, 000, more than 700,000 uh, tons of CO2, which also has a large revenue stream associated with it as well. So my is gonna talk to you about, a little bit about the financials. Thank you. Uh, so we tried to uh, figure out how to monetize the social value chain that we are creating for all these people in the villages. The number that we have here is based on a report generated by World Bank in 2004. For example, irrigation benefit is approximately $18 per farmer. Education benefits, I think, is close to $12 or $13 uh, per, per family. So based on those numbers, we think that we can create a benefit to cost ratio of 3.24. What does that mean? For every dollar that you invest in this business, that will create a social value of $3.25. So if we were to win the, uh, win the prize today of $50,000, that's approximately $170,000 of social value created for these people. Uh, the number looks uh, really big. That is because we are going to serve 8,750 villages by 2018. That is reaching out to 22 million people. $1.7 billion looks huge, but if you convert that into per person, that's approximately $80 to $90. So it's not really a big deal. Uh, how do we reach to our target of 5,000 villages by 2013? We'll have to create uh, an infrastructure. We have proven our model twice. We can do it 5,000 times by 2013. How do we reach there? This year we want to raise $550,000 of angel money, of which 80% will go into CapEx, the rest will go into establishing the basic infrastructure to train technical operators and engineers. In two, once we achieve this milestone in 2009, we need to raise three and a half million dollars, of which only 60% of, of which will go into CapEx. The remaining will go into actually establishing infrastructure so that we can produce 50 engineers every year and approximately 1,000 technical operators by 2011. Here is our uh, financial overview. Uh, due to lack of time, I'll really speed it up now. Uh, we have already been operationally profitable. The numbers that you see here is based on our current implementation. It is not dreamt or thought about. It is actual numbers uh, that we are talking here. We have a profit margin of about 50%. That is going down because we think that the raw material price will go up. The exit value turns out to be close to $485 million based on 8.5 times EBITDA. Next. So in summary, this is a humongous market, 125,000 villages uh, waiting to be served. 350 million people want to join our society or modern society today. This, uh, we have proven our model twice again and we want to do it 5,000 times. We are very confident about this because of the feedback that we got from our customer. Uh, one of the villagers said, uh, or said, 
Uh, India got its independence in 1947, about 60 years ago, but he or that village got their independence in August 2007 when they were lighted. Thank you. All right, um, we're back, and the big decisions have been made. Uh, but before we announce the winner, uh, we have a little uh, special, uh, a special uh, thing we want to do, which is the RGK Center recognizes that winning a business plan competition like this one for a, a new social venture is, a, is, is just one of our many steps to launching a successful venture. So what we did is we created a special prize that went out and looked at all the people who'd been engaged in social enterprise, student social entrepreneurs, who had won prizes at other competitions, uh, and we asked, who did the best job the first year out? Who actually won one a competition, went out, and did something uh, important? And so we solicited uh, 16 teams uh, that had won previously to get a progress report and a sense of what they had accomplished. And today we're going to give a $25,000 prize to the team that's come the furthest in implementing their plan. So while you've heard today the kind of dreams of people going forward, what we're going to now hear is actually what's happened in the first year out um, from someone who, who took uh, the initiative and, and ran with the ball. Um, so please welcome Doug Ullman, president of the Lance Armstrong Foundation, who's going to award this $25,000 RGK Winner's Cup. We call it the Winner's Cup because it's a, it's a cup that goes to the person who's done the best. Doug, thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, and it's a true pleasure to be here. I was thinking about the word social innovation and what it meant to me and, and the roots in my life and, and how this came to be. And I just want to take a minute to, to tell you that I had the privilege of growing up in, a, in the first planned city in the country. And it was called Columbia, Maryland, and it was uh, the vision of a social entrepreneur. And I think back then it would have been called a, a social experiment more than 42 years ago, and, and today we might call it uh, uh, a social enterprise. Um, but the developer there was a guy named Jim Rouse, and Jim preached two different things. He said, one, you must approach the world with brilliant expectations. And so people who grew up there in that diverse community uh, were afforded the opportunity to do just that. And the second thing that he talked about was the stark difference between the definition of a community and the definition of a crowd. And the difference is quite simple. In a crowd, everyone looks around and pushes and shoves and tries to get ahead of one another. And in a community, everyone looks around and collaborates and realizes that no one, in essence, can get ahead unless everyone moves ahead together. And that was the basis for my belief in this idea of social entrepreneurship, uh, social enterprise, and, and social innovation. So it's from that background that, that I'm humbled and honored to be here with you today. Um, you know, working to get others access to uh, health care, uh, preventative uh, medicine, uh, and resources is something that I know a lot personally about in my own battle with cancer and now my work with the Lance Armstrong Foundation as we're focused on inspiring and empowering the millions of people across the country and around the world who are facing a cancer diagnosis. Um, Innovators in Health is doing this exact same thing uh, for a different disease. Uh, they're working to stop drug-resistant tuberculosis. And Innovators in Health is now a team of uh, graduated students from MIT uh, at various levels. Uh, and as you heard from Peter, they won the MIT Ideas Competition last year, and I believe a $7,500 uh, prize went along with that. Um, so I've had the pleasure of uh, just now meeting uh, Sarah and Gretty and Bill uh, and reading their work and their success and their, their progress to date. And I'm going to turn it over to Bill uh, to make a few comments about where they've come in the last year. Thank you very much, Doug, and thank you to Peter and the RGK Center. We're extremely grateful uh, for this award and for the opportunity today to tell you a little bit about our young social venture, uh, Innovators in Health. We've been working for the past year and a half on simple technologies that can improve medication delivery in the developing world. And the problem we're really going after is that the last mile of drug delivery is basically broken. So even though there's a very big infrastructure for developing drugs and for distributing them to local clinics, often there are problems that prevent those drugs from getting into the hands of rural villagers that most need the medications. 
And if you just take the case of tuberculosis, which is a taxing and deadly disease, there are more than two million preventable deaths every year due to this disease. And why is it preventable? Well, if you take the right series of antibiotics for a six to eight month period, uh, like this patient here, you can be completely cured back to your original state of health. So why does treatment fail? Well, there are two big problems. The first is delivery, that health workers are charged to deliver pills to patients and for some reason can't find or deliver the medication. And the second problem is adherence, in that there's a very complex pill regimen that patients have to follow over a six to eight month period. And it's very easy to fall off of that schedule. And unfortunately, most treatment programs today kind of operate in the dark. They don't have a good view of which pills are reaching patients and which patients are taking their medication. So our mission at Innovators in Health is to provide a new infrastructure for collecting data and provide transparent monitoring that empowers the treatment clinics to actually improve their care. So our first solution is a U-Box. Uh, it's a simple electronic pill box. And the way that it works is that every time you turn this box, you dispense a dose of medication. And that creates an internal log on the box, a timestamp for when that medication was dispensed. And also health workers carry a key, which they insert into the box to register their visit to a given patient. And this key is also used to carry the logs from the box back to a clinic where you can visualize this data using a computer. And this data enables all kinds of new things. For example, you can reward health workers that are making very regular visits. Or you can have timely and targeted intervention to target patients that need extra counseling or care. Our next solution is called the U-Phone, where we're using cell phones to provide real-time uh, health status information. So it turns out even in rural India, health workers often have a cellular phone. And our system allows them to use that phone to upload symptoms such as their cough, uh, their temperature, and their weight, which nurses can visualize at a centralized location and inform physicians of problematic trends. So you could identify patients that need urgent care or prioritize visits uh, of the physicians in the field. And of course, physician resources are extremely scarce in rural areas. So this kind of technology can dramatically improve the reach and the effectiveness of those resources. In the last year, we've made a lot of progress. We started with a $7,500 grant, and we've now scaled up uh, to raise $70,000 in grant money. Uh, we've done nine product revisions and now have a fully product, uh, field-ready product, which we actually tested with health workers in rural India earlier this year and got some positive feedback on the usability of the device. We've planned a 400-patient trial for later this summer, and are in due diligence for a 4,000-patient trial uh, later next year. We had an invited presentation to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're in detailed discussions with 11 other partners regarding our technology. By the end of 2009, we hope to reach 4,000 patients at an internal cost of $3 per patient. And because government workers will actually be observing our first trial, we're hoping to leverage government to support to make this a standard of treatment in the Indian state of Bihar and scale up across all 150,000 patients in that state. How are we going to do this? Well, we hope to become a sustainable social venture. Uh, our model is that we will lease the U-Box to care providers, both private and public. And even if you charge $6 per box per patient, that's a small fraction of current treatment costs and gives us a profit margin of $3 per patient. We've already raised a lot of capital, $70,000, but we still need more help to get us through. Uh, for the first trial, we're looking for $160,000. And to be sustainable over the next three to four years, we need something like $486,000, which will split amongst manufacturing, field trials, operations, and design. So we're very excited to scale this up and have a real impact here. And again, we're extremely grateful uh, to the RGK Center for all their support. And we hope we can reach the 14 million patients who are currently suffering from tuberculosis. Thank you. So on behalf of the RGK Center, we want to congratulate Innovators in Health, and uh, we have a trophy to do that that says the RGK Center for Philanthropy and Community Service presents Innovators in Health with the 2008 Winner's Cup Award. Thank you. And they brought uh, a full-blown uh, model here, uh, product uh, for uh, people to take a look at. So feel free after we're done to come up and take a look at the box. Uh, it's right here. Um, now, we're getting close to the, to the finale. Uh, I'm going to announce the winner of the People's Choice. We had, uh, what do we have, 70, 80 ballots, we've cast, which were cast by you, the audience. We have tallied them up, and we're going to announce who the people thought 
won this competition. The winner of the $1,000 People's Choice Award goes to Husk Power Systems. But the people's choice is not the final word. <laughs> the final word goes to Tom Merritt, who will come up now and announce the winner of the Social Innovation Competition 2008 and uh, runner-ups. Tom. Thanks for hanging around, folks. And uh, of course, you guys were going to stay anyway. Um, well, on behalf of the judges, and certainly on behalf of um, Heather and Peter, um, it's my honor to announce the winner uh, of the second annual Social Innovation Competition. Um, just a couple comments. Um, great leaders uh, start as servants first, which accounts, in my opinion, for their essential greatness. Um, and hope. Um, a word that we seemingly hear um, infrequently, but more often of recent times because of the political drama that's occurring in our country, um, is I think essential for our sanity and the wholeness of life. I would like to thank all the competitors, both here and not here, for your efforts and your servant leadership. Um, it was very rewarding to have the opportunity again to be here as a judge and to hear your presentations, but equally importantly, to review them in advance of today's actual presentation. So I'd like to thank you. Um, and without further ado, I would announce uh, that the um, grand prize goes to Husk. So congratulations. <laughs> Upstairs on the internet. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> His timing sucks. I'm so sorry. Uh, well, thank you all so much. What do we need to do? Let's get yeah. some pictures. Okay. Cool. He, he's just. Uh, I should also announce while they're taking that picture that um, we have two additional prizes, um, a prize of $7,500 and a prize of $2,500. And the prize of $7,500 um, goes to uh, Planted and the $2,500 and the... Say that again. Way to go, Manoj. <laughs> Good job. I'm sorry I was late. I was trying to send an email to someone. <laughs> Your timing was impeccable. <laughs> but congratulations. <clears throat> Actually, so just to repeat, we do have a, um, a second and third place prize this year. And the second place prize is $7,500 and the $2,500 to the third place team. And the second place prize goes to Plant It, and Swayam is going to get um, $2,500. So congratulations to you as well. Thank you. And thanks for staying around, folks. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your participation, your voting, and thanks to the competitors for coming uh, all this way and giving us a great show today. So with that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you very much.